Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here, and it's another edition of Shoujo vs. Shonen. So we're looking at the manga Bible from Genesis to Revelation by uh, Siku, and I don't have like a legit uh, Shonen today, like th this whole series, like the joke is it doesn't have to be Shoujo or Shonen to be, to, to be featured in this, but this is pretty uh, Shonen-esque in its style and its emphasis on action. So... Uh, the manga Bible, what to say about it? I've been fascinated by Sunday school art for decades. I've collected multiple illustrated Bibles and comic adaptations of the Bible. And I always noticed how a lot of them seem to have like certain strengths or weaknesses in their representation. So I think uh, on, on Siku's art style, what I'll say is it doesn't feel like authentic manga. It feels like a very British Western artist who's trying to bring in some elements of manga into sort of a sketchy, over-the-top action uh, Western style. And he's actually worked in 2000 AD for Judge Dredd, uh, Slain, and he's co-created Pan-African Judges. So actually, the title's kind of fake news, because if you go into this looking for a manga adaptation of the Bible, I don't think this is the best manga adaptation of the Bible, but it's a really unique, really slick, kind of grungy, almost like Frank miller -y version of the Bible. And even the script emphasizes this. I was at first a little bit annoyed because sometimes there'll be like these moments where they have the characters speak in sort of a contemporary dialogue, dialect. So Joshua says, I don't know about you guys, but I hate long speeches. So I'll get right to the point. In three days, we cross the River Jordan to pick a fight. So, But you eventually start getting into it when you realize what this is. This is trying to specifically emphasize kind of the seedier PG-13 to rated R aspects of the Bible. And so I will... I will give it credit for that. This does not skimp on like the battle sequences and the blood. And it mentions that Rahab is a prostitute. Uh, when it shows King David being tempted by Bathsheba, they actually make a point of showing how beautiful Bathsheba is and why she would be tempting. So this is a decidedly PG-13 uh, rendition of the Bible that doesn't skimp on the, I don't know, less kid-friendly aspects of the Bible stories. Why did I mark this? This is a good illustration, I think, of just the use of black and white and how I don't think this is particularly good manga art, but it is good dynamic angular art. Lots of shadow, lots of silhouette, uh, especially in battle sequences, you know, when, when there's fluttering hair and fluttering capes and explosions of energy, then I think Siku's sort of in his element and it's, it's utterly unique. So I... I guess that's that's the sum of my whole critique. It's really weird. <laughs> you it, you never quite feel like uh, it's it, it makes sense or you, that it's quite consistent with itself. But it's really unique and it's really interesting. Uh, the parables of Jesus and other little stories. Sometimes they'll do like a little comedic, cartoony style in, inspired by super deformed uh, comics. Uh, what was I going to say about this? Oh yeah, this the, this kind of illustrates it. So the parables of Jesus. It's written the prodigal son, and he's crossed out the prodigal son and written the unforgiving brother. I think that's a good little illustration of what the Banga Bible is trying to be. It's trying to emphasize aspects of these Bible stories that you probably heard on the flannel graph in Sunday school that were maybe de-emphasized by the teacher who was afraid it wouldn't be kid-friendly enough. And so I will definitely give Siku props for that. Uh, I mark this because I feel like there, there's some times where it like jumps up and down in quality sharply, and I think... It probably Siku did certain sections out of order or did them earlier on and was still trying to get a feel for the style. And this is where, like, the letters from Paul, I th feel like, is where Siku has kind of... I would guess that this came later because it feels like he's controlled the weebisms a bit and is just starting to draw, like, really the this great grungy indie art that is hit completely his own style. And uh, I think you'll... I think you'll dig it. I, I I don't know. You know, like you have to be like a really particular type of person to enjoy uh, Bible adaptation after Bible adaptation. But th the credit for the manga Bible is I've never seen a Bible adaptation quite like it. And I think it's worth a look. Uh, for our shoujo, we've got My Love Story, Volume 2, story by Kazune Kawahara, art by Aruko. And uh, this continues everything I love about Volume 1 and does more of it. So uh, Suna is kind of like the pretty boy, and I normally hate like the calm, quiet, pretty boys who are all detached and stuff, but the story actually makes him like a real cool dude. And so what this is becoming is this is the story of 
uh, Goda's deep friendship with Suna and his loving relationship with uh, Osa Osaka. Gosh, I can't remember. Yamato. Yamato, I'm sorry. Too many weeb names for me. So uh, what I love about this is Yamato is as feminine as it is possibly as it is possible to be, and Goda is as masculine as it is possible to be, and they even like up the ante on that from volume one. So let's take a look at this. Uh, last time, I think I was reviewing uh, Lovely Complex, and I said I enjoyed it, it was funny, but I didn't feel like much happened in volume one. Uh, my, my love story is a better example of that, where there's consistently these funny, silly stories of Goda being like a hyper-masculine man and being a little bit oblivious and then also having this really charming romance with uh yamato this really charming romance with yamato and uh what i like about this volume is in addition to kind of consistently having you know funny silly stories there will also be like a really funny story and a really emotional story so this one really cracked me up because goda is oblivious and a lot of the humor comes from him being oblivious so he signs up for his first ever high school job and he works at a place called bro cafe machos where he has to wear suspiciously short jeans and like an aa shirt and he doesn't get that this is like the equivalent of a hooters and that's why he was hired and so the humor comes from the fact that goda is so enthusiastic he's so masculine and he's so slow on the uptake when all these guys start coming in, hey, where do you work out? Your deltoids are amazing. I was just like cracking up for the whole chapter. And his mom's like super masculine, you know, like it explains the genetics of where he where he came from. Uh, and then it, it, towards the end, it really hit you with this emotional story about uh, death and the, the fear of death. And it was just really meaningful. So I mean, that's what I dig. It's this really goofy, over-the-top character who's unusual. What makes him unusual is he, this: his role is usually played by the handsome pretty boy in these romance stories. And I really feel like this entire book came from Kazune Kawahara's and Arako's appreciation of macho manliness in, in young men. And they just wanted to make a whole story that was about pushing that to the the most ridiculous limits possible. Just how manly can you make a young high school Japanese dude? I really appreciated their notes where they even tried to emphasize that in his facial structure. Like, that's what he looked like in the first volume, and they, like, up the ante a little bit on his masculinity. And a lot of the humor comes from how intense he is. Like, uh, he will do, like, the short run style for a long-distance run because to him... I guess to him, it's like long distances are short distances. Uh, and I, I like that they actually appreciate him as handsome. Like the gag of the character is he has this big, huge, uh, un unappealing face, but he actually is handsome by the standards of, you know, mas masculine handsome handsomeness. It's just that men, handsomeness isn't the same as beauty. So he is handsome, but he's just not beautiful whatsoever. Uh, they, and they continue with like their total enthusiasm for the world and the character and for masculinity in general. And it's a, it's a really charming little interview between the two of them. So two volumes in, I'm still consistently enjoying myself. Each volume is consistently giving plot elements that are interesting and actually have some emotional resonance. And it's got to be the most uh, ma masculine guy and feminine girl pair up I've ever seen. And I really love that they're together and they're doing stories about uh, them having like their first birthday celebration or their first time holding hands. It's not just like a love triangle where we're waiting and waiting and waiting for them to get together and then they get together at the end and that's it. They're actually telling stories about the young kind of puppy puppy dog love days of romance and I really, really dig it. My Love Story has to be my, uh, let me think, this, my two favorite shojos this year are My Love Story and Anonymous Noise. And I like them for different reasons, but those two are definitely my favorites from the year so far. So uh, that's our nine minutes. Yep, that's our shojo versus... Sort of a shonen by, by Siku. Uh, I'll try to look for more of Siku's work, maybe the stuff he did for Judge Dredd in Western comics. But uh, a very unusual choice. I think you'll like it if you kind of dig that Frank Millery vibe. Like, like, it, it, if the, don't, don't think of it as manga Bible. Think, of, think Frank Miller Bible, and if that interests you, you will probably enjoy Siku. Uh, my love story, highest recommendation. Just an absolute love letter to masculinity and femininity. With that, I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. I love my patrons on Patreon, and I will catch you later.